is one of the earliest dramatic characters that stand in line with Bernard Shaw's philosophy of the life force. In terms of this philosophy, contrary to romantic medieval or Victorian assumptions, the female is the pursuer and the male is the pursuit in the game of love. That's why for George Bernard Shaw, all's well is Shakespeare, one of Shakespeare's best plays. Okay, now talking more about moral judgment and a female sense of morality, we go back to the tragedies. Shakespeare's most striking early experiment with the female mind and heart is seen in his portrayal of Juliet, the heroine of Romeo and Juliet. The violation of the authority of the male-dominated world in this play leads to tragedy. At the very beginning, Juliet, age 14, is presented as a typical feudal girl in full obedience to her parents' wishes. When Lady Capulet, who commissioned to by her husband informs her of young Paris's proposal of marriage, she readily complies with it, assuring her mother that when they meet, she will look at Paris in order to like him. She says, I'll look to like if looking liking moves, but no more deep will I endart mine eye than your consent gives strength to make it fly. In short, nice girls do not look too deeply into the eyes uh, of a young man. So here we have the typical feudal female. But soon, she meets Romeo at the party that very night. And after their first dance, allows him to kiss her twice. From that point on, even when the young lovers find out that they are the children of two families that hate each other, Juliet behaves like a free woman who minds and fights for her heart's desire. In spite of patriarchal restrictions that surround the daughter's life, she secret, secretly but bravely marries her enemy and spends her wedding night with him in her own chamber. Her soliloquy that comes before Romeo's arrival as her husband is clear proof that in a few hours in the play, she has been transformed from an obedient daughter of a patriarchal family into a hot lover waiting passionately for the night to come and bring her, bring to her, her Romeo. This is what she says. Spread thy close curtain, loud performing night, that runaway's eyes may wink, and Romeo leap to these arms, untalked of and unseen. Come, gentle night, come, loving black-browed night, Give me my Romeo. The morning before, she was asking her mother's permission to look uh, at Paris. Juliet remains the fem a loving female till the end of the play. She openly goes against the has hasty marriage arrangement with Paris by even defying her father's threat of physical violence. She's brave enough to drink the potion that would make her look dead. And finally, when she sees Romeo lying lifeless in her arms, when she wakes up some hours later, she does not hesitate to stab herself to death. Her constancy of mind in sticking to her choices and her courage to die for love attains for her the rank of tragic. Harold. Ophelia in Shakespeare's later tragedy, Hamlet, can neatly be contrasted with Juliet in that throughout the play, she remains imprisoned within the rules of patriarchal society. 
Unlike Juliet, who has achieved her freedom of choice at the cost of her life, Ophelia simply obeys her father, Polonius, her brother, Laertes, who warn her against losing her virginity in case she welcomes Hamlet's advances. Hamlet, in turn, projects his resentment concerning his mother's marriage to his uncle upon poor Ophelia by his biting remarks uh, concerning sending her to a nunnery and so on. With her father dead later on, her brother far away, and Hamlet sent to England, Ophelia is left alone in a patriarchal world without male guidance and intervention. She slowly goes mad and begins to express her suppressed sexuality in her songs. She dies a virgin, the pathetic victim of the male-dominated world. In contrast to Ophelia's deplorable position, Hamlet's mother, Gertrude, has been endowed with the luxury of enjoying the life of a female as an object of desire in a patriarchal society. She fully obeys the man-made rules of her society and derives pleasure from the love and protection she receives under the wings of a male. Although these two females stand on opposite poles, poles of womanhood, they are similar in that they can easily be manipulated by males and that, unlike King Claudius, who is a clever man, they are mentally too shallow to try to understand Hamlet's mind. Remember, one is the loud one, the other one is the mother. They are too shallow to understand Hamlet's mind and heart and attribute his words and behavior to his presumed madness. Desdemona of Othello presents another variation of the feudal female in that, like Juliet, she defies the rules of her society and disobeys her father by marrying the man of her choice. Yet in marriage, no matter how lightheartedly spoiled she may appear in her behavior towards her husband, she seriously assumes the rule of a feudal wife and remains a loving, obedient woman to the point of even accepting death from the hands of Othello. Desdemona achieves the quality of tragic heroine by bravely paying the price of the choice she had made. And finally, the position of Lady Macbeth in the tragedy of Macbeth represents Shakespeare's most important test case study of the conventional outlook on women in his time. For once, the discussion at hand is not concerned with female virginity, girls seeking love in marriage, women's constancy, the female as a shrew, or a woman competing with her husband. This time, Shakespeare is on, on his way to investigate the female's sense of morality and mental capacity for moral choice. We find that throughout the play, Lady Macbeth remains within the Elizabethan and Jacobian concept of women. Shakespeare traps Lady Macbeth in her stereotyped role as female, as wife, mother and helpmate to the male in the male-dominated world and observes the outer and inner experience she goes through. We observe that even the all-important function Lady Macbeth serves in making her husband the monster he turns out to be, is associated with her role as a loving wife who has devoted her life to his happiness in assuming the task of making him king. Lady Macbeth believes that she can put up with the acts of violence prevalent in the male world to which she is a complete stranger. And she believes such violence can be employed as a household chore, only to find out after Duncan's death that murder is by no means 
a domestic affair. She slowly goes through a process of spiritual recession that extends towards her sleepwalking scene and her eventual death. Her sense of morality has not allowed her to survive the trauma caused by what she has done. Juliet Dusenberg notes that Macbeth's tragic mistake is to try to rise above his status as a human being. Lady Macbeth, on the other hand, rejects her womanhood to make Macbeth a man. Seeking to become more than a woman, she becomes less than one. As Pelperin points out, Lady Macbeth cannot fully become the fiend, the devil she tries to be, and her eventual madness is the index of the very humanity she wanted to negate. Her lack of moral judgment, a concept hardly associated with the identity of the female within the cultural programming of Shakespeare's time, makes her a pathetic figure who values manhood about womanhood and neglects to consider humanity as the essential quality upon which the virtues of both sexes depend. All the same, when we contrast her with Goneril and Raven, the elder daughters of King Lear, who are totally deprived of any sense of morality, our sympathy for Lady Macbeth deepens, for she remains within the moral matrix of humanity as she has fully experienced the horror of what she has done and she has paid the price. This is the point to stop. Thank you for your Thank you, Ayshegil Hoja, for this wonderful...